I'm putting my take home messages up first. Um, we're talking about uh, continuous cropping and by that um, I mean cropping without a pasture phase. That's essentially what, what I'm talking about. And I guess my take home message is this, it can be sustained for decades, uh, but it requires careful management. Um, I'm going to talk about three main challenges in, in maintaining profitable continuous cropping and they are uh, managing soil fertility decline, uh, weed management, particularly herbicide resistance, talk a little bit about managing the economic risks, uh, and then propose that the, the, what underpins success is having a diversity of crops, a diversity of end uses for those crops and being f flexible uh, about practices. So I guess it's no news to us that cropping systems have been intensifying over the last several decades. Um, you can see on that graph uh, to the left, uh, the, the big area in, in, in crop area, uh, the decline in sheep numbers, and that's basically associated with a loss of pasture area. And also the fact that managers are now, managers of these um, far larger farms are having, um, having to manage more country with less time. Um, so this is a trend that's been going on for, for several decades. Um, and despite that, I think there's a lot of opportunity still in cropping, obviously. Uh, most, most crops we grow still have exploitable yield gaps between what we're achieving and what we believe the potential to be. Um, there's continuing improvement in varieties, particularly varieties of some of the alternative break crops. Um, we've seen over recent years uh, how we can get synergies from putting packages of better better agronomy together, um, summer fallow management, earlier sowing, some of the recent um, boosts in yield we've been able to achieve. Um, I'd also say that the much talked about yield plateaus uh, in the last 15 years or so, um, some recent work showing that's very much uh, driven by climate uh, and that climate limitation, I mean our, our improved um, technologies and adoption of technologies unprecedented to keep up with that climate and I'll change and I'll talk about that in a second. And also the point that um, overlying all that is that we know the top 25% of our grain specialists are making double the return on capital as the other 75. So there are many opportunities for us to continue to, Im to improve. Um, Australia developed a mixed farming system for good reason. We have variable climate, we have variable prices, and we also have a lot of variability in land, both across individual farms and across regions, which made a mixed farming system very sensible and still makes a mixed farming system very sensible. Um, a few years ago, myself and colleagues wrote this book chapter where we looked at this intensification, intensification of cropping and asked, well, where is it heading and what are the consequences? And I guess one thing I wanted to point out was that um, a conclusion talking to a lot of consultants was that really, it really wasn't about what you were doing, it was about how well you did it. Um, and so management skill was a key to the profitability of a farm, irrespective of whether you were continuously cropping or in a mixed farm. So I don't want my talk this morning to be an argument about whether mixed farming is better than continuous cropping. We're really focusing on the people that have decided to continuously crop, a part or all of their farm. Um, and what are the challenges and issues that are going to have to be managed to maintain the profitability of those enterprises? So just mention those climate trends. This is a recent paper that's just been published by Svee Hoffman. I think it's quite interesting. And what it's demonstrating is that since about 1990, we've had a, a climate-driven 27% reduction on what our yield potential um, uh, has been. In other words, our capacity to grow crops has been limited by the climate. Warmer conditions speeding up crop development, reducing grain number and, and yield potential, uh, extreme heat and frost, uh, and it really hasn't been offset very much by the increased carbon dioxide. So the good news is that um, although we've had that 30, close to 30% reduction in our potential, actual farm yields have been pretty much holding steady, which means you know, our technology, our improved technology has been getting adopted, we have been getting um, improvements, but it's really just been making up for the, what the climate has served us up. So, so that's good news in a sense, but the more challenging news if you look into that paper is that those that have been predicting the likely consequences of climate on our crop yields, it appears may have, unpredict, have under, um, underestimated what that has been, at least for the last several, uh, the last um, couple of decades. Um, and so it's a challenge for us to consider that, particularly in a continuous cropping enterprise, um, that if this is the trend that's going to continue, 
um, uh, then we're going to need to take that into account in, in developing our, our systems. So that's a, an interesting read. So I mentioned three things in my list, and the first was soil fertility. Um, I guess as we have shifted away from pasture area and started cropping more of farms, we've also adopted um, no-till farming systems, and we're the biggest adopters in the world. Uh, this is some data from, from, from Rick Llewellyn's recent review. And there's no doubt that no-till um, and stubble retention system uh, protects the soil from erosion, uh, helps us to maintain soil structural stability, uh, and has many other economic benefits. But I guess the question here is, um, are we able to maintain the, the, the organic fertility of the soil under these systems in the same way that pastures have done? We know from a lot of work that pastures um, can build soil carbon and soil organic matter. Um, and our typical mixed farming system built that fertility during the pasture phase and then utilised it during the cropping phase. And we, stay, we kept the soil in reasonable balance. But a lot of recent data on long-term no-till um, experiments around the world are really showing that it's very difficult to build soil carbon even with a fully no-till farming system. Um, and the best systems are, are maintaining the soil fertility but not, but not building it, and many are continuing to lose soil organic matter. Here's a, uh, a long-term trial from, from uh, Wagga uh, a few years ago, just showing there the, the loss in carbon in kilograms per hectare per year over a long-term trial. And you can see that the bottom there, even our best system of loop and wheat rotation, full stubble retention and, and direct drilling, um, we're still losing a little bit of carbon. It wasn't significant over this time frame, but we're not, we're not building soil organic matter as we might have thought. So why aren't we able to build soil organic matter when we're retaining all our residue and not cultivating the soil? And I think Clive Kirkby's work in recent years has helped us to answer this. The answer is really that we have to stop thinking about carbon and think about organic matter. And stable organic matter, the stuff that provides the fertility for your crops, contains carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur. They're all there in relatively predictable amounts, which is, which is why the stuff can, can deliver fertility. So Clive, I guess, asked the question, you know, is it, is it a lack of these nutrients and not a lack of carbon that's limiting our capacity to build organic matter? He conducted an experiment at our long-term site at Harden where he took over a treatment where we'd been incorporating all the residue every year um, for, for 20 or so years when he started. Um, we continued to incorporate all the residue. We had about nine tonnes of residue on average there. And he either added some supplementary nutrients or not, according to those ratios there, according to um, how much nutrients he believed was, was required to maximise the conversion of that stubble into stable organic matter. So that was the only difference between the two treatments. And over the six years he was there, essentially we continued to lose soil carbon, soil organic matter, from the treatment where we were incorporating all the residue, but we actually built soil organic matter where we were adding the nutrients as well. So this is not a plea for you to all start incorporating residue, and, um, uh, and uh, it, it's really a demonstration of the principle that we need more than just carbon to build soil organic matter. And if you think about our cropping systems, we're extremely careful and cautious with our nutrients to apply it so that the, the crop gets the majority of that. We need to make a return on that investment. But if we do that, and if we do that in the long term, there, and there are no nutrients left to maintain the soil fertility, then that fertility will decline. And this has been shown uh, by many, again, long-term studies around the world. And if you, th if you think of that fertility in terms of nitrogen, in terms of the total nitrogen, um, we know that under continuous cropping, organic nitrogen will decline at about 2 to 3% per year in southern Australia. Um, and you can see on the left I'm showing the organic carbon, and you can see the humus, the stable um, carbon that, that's supplying that fertility declining over time. And the organic nitrogen essentially follows that same trend because the nitrogen and the carbon in that soil organic matter are in pretty stable ratios. So if we're in a continuous cropping system and we no longer have a pasture phase, um, then essentially if we just think about the nitrogen fertility, maintaining that nitrogen fertility, I guess we've got two options. The first is to use fertiliser nitrogen. Um, and this is a graph put together by John Angus in a recent paper, sort of showing that through the first several decades um, here we really weren't 
we're really mining the soil organic matter, the, 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 the native soil organic matter, and subsequently the organic matter being built by the pastures. More recently, fertiliser nitrogen has had to increase nationally to, to start to, um, um, to supply some of the nitrogen to our crops. But even now, um, quite often, we're not in positive um, nitrogen balance in many systems. The other option, of course, is to utilise legumes to provide free nitrogen from the atmosphere. And legumes can do this to, to different degrees. Um, I've just been talking about pastures, and we know pasture phases are, are, are effective at building um, organic carbon and organic nitrogen. Um, pulses are also um, effective. Uh, the problem with harvested pulses is that you remove a lot of that nitrogen in the grain, and so often the amount of N, the net input of N to your system is much lower where you're harvesting that pulse. But brown manure pulses, for example, can, can often match um, pastures. You'll see a lot of variation here, and there will be other speakers dealing with this. Uh, a pulse has to be, um, the biomass that the pulse produces, it has to be fixing in effectively, it has to be well nodulated, and grow a lot of biomass in order to achieve these higher numbers that I'm showing. Um, and so um, it's how you grow the pulse, um, and, and obviously whether it's used for harvested grain or not, it's going to determine what the net input to your system is. So if we consider the consequences of this, I've just sort of shown a typical graph here of the rundown in that soil carbon over time. Um, uh, obviously, when, you, when you've got a lot of organic fertility and that's mineralising, a, lo a lot of your, your um, requirement for crops can be supplied by that mineralisation. But as you slide down this, this, um, this relationship, less and less of the nitrogen required by your crops can be provided by the soil and more and more has to be provided by fertiliser. So here's an example for sort of southern New South Wales, 300 mil growing season rainfall. Um, currently you might be typically um, getting about 100 kilos of N from the soil, mineralising from that soil organic matter into the crop and supplying about 80 from nitrogen. If you continue to crop that soil with no pasture phase uh, and continuously cropped it, you can see how over time, even in 20 years, how that switches around and, and you're going to be forced into systems where more and more of that nitrogen has to be supplied by fertiliser, uh, because less will be, you'll be slipping down this uh, slope and less will be available from your soil. And uh, you can see how, um, how that increases the proportion of your total costs each year that, nit that the nitrogen bill is going to represent. And even in a lower rainfall area, um, with smaller yields coming off, less nitrogen going on, the same trend is there and the same sort of proportional increase in, in the total costs as a percentage of your gross margin, the fertiliser bill will become. So just the question is, um, not that this is perhaps not manageable, but, but um, are you ready to, is your system and your enterprise ready to deal with this, with this uh, increase need to, to provide that fertiliser nitrogen and whether that increases risk in your, in your business? Just some data now from, from more locally from the long-term um, trial um, at Longerong, and thanks to, to Roger Armstrong and Fiona Robertson, if she's in the audience, for providing this data. So um, this is a long-term trial that's been running for several years, and those guys have looked at the long-term carbon and nitrogen, the impacts of tillage and different rotation systems. But just to cut a long story short, if you sort of look at what the continuous wheat um, system was like, so this is in, measured in 2014, the total carbon stocks in the top 30 centimetres, and you can see the things that have increased carbon are green manure once every three years, or a three-year crop, three-year pasture phase. The things that have decreased the soil carbon have been a fallow every third year. Um, and interestingly, in 2014, they measured how much mineral N was being provided by these treatments, and you can see, you know, the pasture, um, the, this treatment that had a three-year pasture still providing 113 kilos of mineral N per year compared to these. So just demonstrating that same principle um, on, a, on a more local scale. So um, I guess our option with the fertiliser is to become more efficient with the fertiliser. Um, typically, John Angus's recent review suggests that of the fertiliser we put on crops currently, only 44% ends up um, in the crop. 34% ends up back in the soil, and that may be adding to the soil organic pool, but we're still losing, on average, 22% loss. Often it's more. So if we can reduce this, this loss and capture more in the crop initially, 
um, or in the crop and soil and keep it in the system, then we can essentially slow down that, that rate of decline and, and reduce the risk, the financial risk in the system. And there's going to be a lot of other people, I think, talking about um, how to do this. Um, and Rob Norton and, and has been um, at the forefront of, of, of um, uh, telling people how to go about that. But there's a lot of ways to try and improve the efficiency of this fertiliser. My one caution is that if you simply think of nutrient use efficiency or nitrogen use efficiency as, as, as the kilograms of grain you're pulling off per kilo of nitrogen you're putting on, Remember that you can still be very efficient with that definition, but just be mining that soil organic matter. And, and that will eventually catch up with you to the point where you'll be needing more and more of that nitrogen to be supplied from fertiliser. And if you can manage that risk in your business, that's, that's fine, but be aware that that's happening. The other way, of course, is to integrate legumes. As I said, if you live in an area uh, or on a soil um, or near a market where you can get a high value legume into your system, well, happy days. And you can sort of see the area of lentils. This is for South Australia. Um, so lentils and chickpeas, very high value. Um, uh, and if you can get them regularly into your system, um, that's certainly going to assist. But be, remember what I showed you about the fact that removing the grain with a high amount of nitrogen can often lead to less nitrogen going in than you might perhaps anticipate. But there are other diverse end uses for legumes in your system, such as hay, brown manures, um, uh, even grazing. And there's going to be some speakers later at this meeting to talk about how to make sure you're getting the best out of these legumes, whatever kind of legume they are, in your system. What I wanted to show is some data. This is um, some data from the Water Use Efficiency Project from a few years ago, but it's from Hopeton. And it just shows an experiment where they had a, a four-year sequence starting with a different break and then three years of wheat, just to see if you could get a break crop in there that was profitable over, a, over that four-year period. I've compared everything here to continuous wheat for grain. So this line here is for the clay soil um, for that treatment. This is for the, for the sandy soil. And you can see a number of those other treatments that included a break crop here, a legume for hay or grain. A number of those uh, are more profitable than the continuous wheat when you actually work it out over a full four years. And that's because the legume brown manure, and some of these are, are brown manure options, um, they're offering um, water savings in that second year of the sequence, and they're offering nitrogen supply savings all the way through the sequence. And when you take that into account and do the economics over the full um, four years, many of them turn out to be quite profitable. So it's important to understand that, that, that longer term view. Closer to where we are in Tamora, uh, in an area where the canola wheat wheat uh, rotation is, is, um, is quite popular and quite profitable, um, we were interested to know whether we could um, develop a more diverse and perhaps more sustainable and less risky system and here we've got a vetch hay with canola, wheat and barley. And you can basically see that, again, over a four-year phased sequence, we've been able to reduce our total costs, and that's mostly um, or largely due to reduced nitrogen going onto the vetch and less nitrogen required then for the canola. Um, and we've been able to uh, have a, um, a more profitable system um, with this more diverse system than the sort of typical high-value, um, high-input canola, wheat, wheat system. So looking for opportunities to, to utilise legumes in your system um, is important. I'll mention phosphorus briefly. So, so mostly I was talking about nitrogen um, fertility there. Obviously any nutrient can ultimately limit a continuous cropping system if you don't keep your eye on it. Phosphorus is also an important one. We're less worried now about running out of phosphorus um, as we are about um, subsoil depletion. Not so much in the southern region, more in the northern region. Um, but we're always looking for ways to make phosphorus more efficient. We're looking for um, novel fertiliser products, uh, deep placement strategies, or crops that have a capacity to, to get hold of some of that phosphorus that's normally not available um, in the soil. Soil acidity is another issue. This is an ongoing and slow uh, process that's happening in soils, and under continuous cropping, um, uh, that process will continue. 
Um, again, we're not going to run out of lime anytime soon, and we understand a lot about uh, liming and how to deal with, with the uh, acidification of soils under cropping systems. But what we are seeing is an acidification of, of subsurface layers, and this can be insidious if, if you're not tracking it. Situations where um, if you're doing an, a no-till system, and Mark Conyers will talk in more detail about this, in no-till systems where you're not disturbing the soil, where the lime and all the organic matter is just going onto the surface, you can continue to acidify the subsurface because you're not getting that lime into the soil. So here's a soil where if I took a soil test here, uh, 0 to 10, both of these treatments would tell me I had a pH of about 5 and I probably didn't have an issue. But you can see where I've been doing long-term no-till. I've got a lot of um, lime at the top. Here I've got, an acid, I've, I've got an acid layer and I'm putting my seed right into that when I sow the crop. So if you're particularly sowing a legume that, that um, this is going to influence the, the um, nodulation uh, and growth of acid-sensitive crops. Uh, other people have more challenging soils in the West, and particularly uh, soils that are just acid all the way down, and they're um, having to sort of uh, do more um, uh, intensive sort of amelioration, getting lime into those soils. But they are getting um, they are getting profitable responses over there. So moving from the fertility um, the fertility um, fertility issue to, to weeds. Um, I had to get James Hunt into the talk somewhere, and so this is James's shadow. Um, this is on his home farm at Kerrang, and he just wanted me to share this anecdote. Um, essentially, he had a paddock on the home farm, which was continuous cereal for 13 years. It was perfectly profitable, wasn't the best paddock on the farm, wasn't the worst, uh, until ryegrass became group B resistant. Um, and he's had to go into two hay cuts to get the, the weeds under control. So essentially the point is this is often the first place that the wheels fall off. Again, there's a lot of uh, uh, other people more expert at this than I, um, but the development of herbicide resistance is obviously an issue under continuous cropping that can be accelerated. And the goal in your system is really to reduce the number and how often weeds get exposed to a particular mode of action. And there are a number of different strategies that you really need to put into place including rotating your crops and your herbicides. Um, there's a number of other strategies now, having vigorous crops, harvest weed seed management, and strategic tillage um, in order to achieve this, this goal. Um, and what I'd say, again, the diversity of crops underpins a strategy to, to be able to achieve this economically. So over the last few years um, in southern New South Wales, um, Tony Swan and others with FarmLink have been um, looking at um, whether we can get break crop options into our sequence. As I said, it's a pretty uh, intensive canola wheat type system up there. Could we get some of these other diverse options into the system in an economic way? And here's just an example of one of the trials we finished recently, looking at a range of different break crop options and different input treatments, higher and lower value herbicides, etc., to see if we could manage weeds. Uh, we're, we went into a site here that had a pretty challenging ryegrass seed bank. And you can see a number of um, either no break crops, sort of just continuous wheat, trying to use some of the aggressive herbicides, or even a single Roundup ready canola. Um, Either wasn't enough to get on top of the weeds, I mean, we, we, we made our weed problem worse, or we spent so much money trying to control the weeds that it wasn't profitable. Um, so that none of these options were really um, recommended. But there were a range of either single break crop or double break crop options here in these three year sequence that allowed us to get the weed numbers down and were quite profitable at the same time. And some of them involved hay, um, legumes uh, and, and rival the, these intensive systems where we are trying to manage a, a weed problem at the same time. This is another example um, uh, of a trial that's part of the, the Stubble Initiative. Um, here we're comparing um, that aggressive approach and the sustainable uh, again, uh, but we've got a conservative approach here using um, TT canola, um, and um, lower, lower cost herbicides to try and save on money. Again, you can see that approach, even though the canola yields and wheat yields are, are reasonably respectable, um, we really didn't get on top of our weed problem. Um, although we were reasonably profitable and at low risk, we really still had, after four years, a big weed problem to deal with. Whereas both the um, aggressive option and the more sustainable option um, were able to get the weed numbers down 
you can see that the sustainable option was able to make more money at lower risk than the higher, um, the higher and more aggressive strategy. So it is possible, if you take a longer view, to even in these very high value, high input systems that are focused on wheat and canola, um, over a longer period to, um, to, be, to remain profitable with lower risk and, 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 and manage some of these issues that arise. Um, weeds are going to be an ongoing challenge uh, and there are more expert people who will be talking to you over the next couple of days about that. So I wanted to mention diseases and pests. I haven't spent a lot of time in the paper. Uh, essentially the same basic message uh, holds for diseases and pests as for weeds. Diversity is the key um, and my question is which one of these you know, are you not going to be able to affordably manage in your continuous cropping system? And I'd say some, if any of your pests or diseases have these sorts of characteristics then you really are going to have to keep a very close eye on them. If they're developing resistance to existing fungicides, if they're overcoming genetic resistance, if they have a very wide host range, um, if they're, uh, if they're exotic, and you'll hear more about Russian wheat aphid, I mean, these are all the things that you need to keep an eye on with pests and diseases. A good example is, is Pratolenchus thornii, a nematode um, in the northern region. It hosts on wheat, barley, chickpea, and most of the summer crops. So even the people that had a pretty diverse rotation um, were often building up this, this pathogen to the point where it became limiting for their, for their system and they had to make a change. Uh, and just from my own personal experience, um, this is a long-term trial at Harden that I've been managing for 28 years. And, and in that time, I've had to do something about weed issues twice with, with um, legume crops cut for hay. Um, I'm still getting pretty respectable yields, uh, but my, my soil carbon at the site has dropped from 1.3 to 0.9. So even with my um, what I thought was reasonable agronomic management, I've essentially been mining the fertility at that site. Um, uh, which, and it's, it's still been re reasonably diverse. So in a continuous cropping system, it's just very hard to arrest that, um, to arrest that soil fertility decline. So just moving on to the final uh, part of the talk, economic risks. Um, what I've been showing you up to date was all plot experiments that where we've been looking at um, essentially what's happening in a single paddock over time and trying to understand that. Now, that, that's limited because we can only look at a certain number of seasons and we're on pretty small plots. And things like weed management are pretty hard to, to often get uh, to, to match what you may be dealing with in your, in your commercial paddocks on small plots. We can use models, simulations and models, to help us extrapolate the small plot work over time. And, and in this case, using a, a, a combination of APSIM and LUSO, this was looking at what continuous cropping, one year breaks, or a, or a brown manure every fourth year um, can do to a long-term system. Uh, this is the profitability. Uh, so models can help us look at this over time. Um, but even with the models, we can't really look carefully at the things that can often bring a business unstuck. And those are things like labor, debt, equity, farm size, all of the I guess all of the business indicators that, that you'll be dealing with on a real farm. Um, and uh, recent, uh, recent analysis of, I guess, the economic climate farmers have been facing would suggest that essentially the income to cost ratios have changed. And so if growers are having to spend a lot more money these days to make the same amount of money. So. Um, this is, this is a really critical thing for the business to think about, and particularly if you're moving into continuous cropping where I've just indicated to you that you, know, you may be needing to fork out more for fertiliser, keep on top of weeds. It's going to be very important to, to keep an eye on your costs. Um, and so this is a, an example of a, of a whole farm business model. This was um, done by Mike Moody and Ed Hunt, but a lot of consultants have been doing this sort of analysis with their clients. And there's a few key things to sort of point out here. Um, first of all, it's important to look at what happens over, over a series of different years um, and year types. So this is a decile. These are the driest years. These are the wettest years. And this is the performance, whole farm performance um, of a number of different systems. So you can see that in the wetter years, obviously, the, the crop uh, system, the, the higher intensity crop system was favoured. But in the 
but in the lower uh, rainfall years, um, they came unstuck. And I guess the message is beware of just looking at your average numbers, because on average, everything looks pretty okay and not very different. But the question is, can your business, um, can your business weather, uh, can, it, can it weather these um, challenging years, and are you capitalising on the opportunities in those good years? And so what, uh, oh, and just to point out that if you don't have diversity, um, you can be in trouble uh, in all years, or at least, you know, not, not achieving your optimum in all years. But I guess the, the question for, uh, for us as, as agronomists is, can we develop systems where we can capture the upside in these favourable years, but have a, has a, have a system that doesn't crash in the bad years, but is a little bit more buffered against those, against those difficult years? And I guess that's the challenge when we think about our systems and our agronomy, and I've given you a few examples of, of potentially ways that we can try to develop systems that perhaps look a little bit more like that. So um, when I was putting the talk together and talking to a lot of consultants and they provided me with um, some of these business analyses, I found sort of three um, really useful uh, analyses where the consultants had looked at what was the success, what were the success metrics of the businesses that were doing pretty well. And it was amazing how, consistent, how consistently a few things turned up. So the first thing is essentially the technical competence, being organised, being timely, being across your agronomy. That clearly was a success um, um, metric and particularly of continuous cropping systems where timeliness and, and, and management and being ready um, was really important. But equally important was the business side of things, keeping an eye on costs, um, understanding debt and your business situation, that was another um, common, common factor across the studies. But also the people management, having staff skilled up and capable of, of, of utilising new technology to assist to manage the risk and to manage the business. So those were, um, those were all sort of um, success metrics, metrics. And I think that, that final third issue, the economic management, is, is um, kind of every bit as important as some of the agronomic competence that we, were, we discussed earlier. So just to finish up um, with my take home messages again, um, yes, continuous cropping can be sustained, at least for decades, um, but it does require careful management. Um, the main challenges, are, oops, the main challenges um, that I've discussed with you are fertility decline. Um, we are going to have to get legumes into the system and, and keep an eye on the, on the whole nutrient balance of the system. Managing mineral nitrogen from year to year is going to be important, but don't take your eye off the longer term trends in your system. Embrace integrated weed management, you'll hear more about that. Uh, and this understanding business risks and analysing the business economically is also important. And I would just again make the point that I think that the answer to managing these challenges is maintaining a suitably diverse portfolio for your business, end use portfolios as well, hay, brown manure if it suits. Um, and also being flexible with your practices. With that, I'd like to thank the um, co-authors, the many consultants I irritated by phone, and the grower groups who, um, who we work with to provide some of the data I presented. Thanks.